The North Atlantic War by Michael Trella. Operation Dagger. Stage 3. Battle of Kulisuk. Admiral Rolf stood patiently at the command bridge of the George VI. Out along the deck, sailors could be seen rushing to and fro, making preparations for the bombardment. The main batteries were being cleaned, primed, and loaded, and before long the whirring of machinery could be heard across the ship and the massive siege guns rotated in the direction of the Republic's coast. Similar preparations were being made all throughout the fleet as the other battleship, the HMS Henry V, and the cruisers readied their big guns as well, while the destroyers primed their long-range surface-to-surface missile bays. It didn't take much time before the entire support fleet was ready to engage. All Rolf needed now was word from Colonel Ruckinson, and he'd rain hell upon the targeted city. Five minutes passed, then ten, fifteen. Then the radio began to buzz with static as the channel opened. Admiral, sir, we have just received word from the land forces that they are in position. Excellent. Put me through to the entire fleet. He waited a few seconds while the signal was expanded. He took a look at his watch. 3.27 p.m. This is Admiral Rolf. We are cleared to engage the enemy. All batteries open fire. A thunderstorm rose up about him as dozens of heavy artillery guns roared to life, sending equal amounts of high-explosive shells to the shore. Massive SSMs whooshed overhead as well, bound to slam home into their targets with pinpoint accuracy. Thus it was that on April 20th, 2042, at 3.27 p.m., the first shots of the North Atlantic War were fired. The thunderstorm begins whispered Captain Cornelius Cyprian. He had been put in charge of the small garrison left to guard Kulisuk, and although it was almost a surefire way to get himself killed, he had accepted the command ship willingly. His men numbered a mere 300, and were armed mostly with hunting rifles, AK-47s, and a small arsenal of improvised explosive devices. In essence, they looked like poorly armed terrorist guerrilla warriors. That's what they wanted, too. He could see the apprehension on the faces of the thirty soldiers who were sheltering with him in the underground bunker. The earth quaked and shook violently as the bombardment tore the evacuated city apart in hailstorms. Remember the plan, soldiers, he said, trying to ease the tension in the cramped, iron-bound room. We are to wait out the shelling in the bunkers. Once it ceases, we get our arses out to the surface and set up according to defense plan Gamma F. The men nodded, expression still grim and focused. No fear, thank God. Just tension. Cyprian clutched his brown scapular and crossed himself. Several others followed suit. The bombardment lasted for 45 minutes. 45 minutes of constant concussions from massive artillery shells raining down at a rate of nearly 200 a minute. Dust filled the room as it was shaken from the ceiling. Several times, shells landed directly above the bunkers, and the men were certain that the next one would be the one to do them in. As it were, however, the shelters held. Suddenly, as if time stopped altogether, the universe went quiet. The booming of explosions ceased, the whining of incoming projectiles died out, and the shocks of naval artillery shells pounding the earth cut off abruptly. The soldiers tensed, Captain Cyprian grabbing the door handle with an iron grip. Sweat beaded down their faces. Veins rising to the surface of their skin as their bodies prepared for the adrenaline rush. The shrill cacophony of the engines of low-flying jets filled their ears. That was it. The shelling was done. That's our cue, men, the captain shouted, having the massive blast door open with all his might, excitement and desperation lending him extra strength. Go, go, go! The others didn't need to be told twice. It took all five seconds before the thirty of them were joining their fellow troops on the surface as they dashed through the rubble to their designated positions. Rubble. That's all the city was now. Not a single structure was left undamaged. If it wasn't completely reduced to ruin, it would crumble at the next explosion to go off within thirty feet of it. Teeth-rattling crashes resounded in the atmosphere as building after ruined building fell apart at their seams. Fires dotted the area from ignited gas burners and gasoline stations. Scaffolding jutted out toward the sky like grotesque iron fingers, twisted in agony. All in all, it was a complete mess. It was a scare tactic, 
designed to cow the Republic into submission lest they suffer a similar fate as Kulasuk. The Republic had expected no less. The soldiers were quick to set themselves up in the double half-moon formation, a dozen or so lagging behind to set up several IEDs in the most likely places where enemy troops would pass. Jets bearing the marks of the Royal Air Force zoomed overhead, circling the city as if they were vultures in search of spare carcasses. They have our position! Cyprian yelled down the line. The air began to suddenly pulse in and out of their ears, the pressure dramatically fluctuating multiple times per second. Helicopters inbound at 12 o'clock, came a voice from th the front line. Cyprian looked up to find at least a dozen Augusta Westland AW-269 Wildcat 3 attack choppers hovering menacingly over the wreckage, slowly approaching their lines like birds of prey. RPGs ready, shouted Cyprian, the call echoing down the line 15 times before the complete force had gotten the message. He looked back out over the city. The Wildcats would tear through them like a dog with a child's homework if they didn't act quickly, the nearest being hardly a hundred meters away. As it approached, he could see the massive Pinto-mounted machine gun as it turned left and right, scanning the line for the best unfortunate defender to pick off first. His attention was subsequently broken by a whoosh of air, followed by a trail of smoke. A second later, the rocket-propelled grenade smashed through the chopper's windshield and detonated within the cockpit. The aircraft shook violently from the force of the explosion, spiraling into the ruins of an unidentifiable structure and knocking down the last remaining wall that had been left standing from the bombardment. Cyprian smiled in irony. Such a menacing, powerful engine of war laid low by a single shot from a poorly armed and outnumbered defense corps. A sudden hailstorm broke out all along the lines as the remaining 14 or so wildcats closed in at increased speed. Looks like we made them mad. Hit the deck! He shouted, dropping just in time to escape being turned into mincemeat as a furious barrage of 7.62 millimeter rounds pummeled their fortifications. The roar of the guns was deafening, but his spine chilled as he could still hear the cries of agony and thuds of bodies kissing dirt of those among his men who hadn't made it down in time. An explosion detonated 50 feet down the line as an air-to-surface missile blasted a three-meter gap in the front half-circle of defenders. Cyprian was getting angry now. He expected casualties, but to lay there and hear seven of his men get blown to pieces and not do anything about it was unbearable. He grabbed his AK-47 lying at his feet and peeked above the barrier, the barrage having briefly paused. Seeing that the nearest wildcat was in range, he swung the gun to bear and pulled the trigger. Bullet holes peppered the glass of his windshield as the heavy machine gun's rounds went straight through the bulletproof glass, and soon red splotches began to appear all around the cockpit's interior as the pilot's arteries were torn to shreds. His example had a double effect. Not only did he feel as though he avenged at least one of his fallen men, his daring also inspired the rest of the rear line to open fire as well. When the helicopters resumed fire, the defenders took it head-on, matching the gunship shower of lethal projectiles with roaring gunfire of their own. The one which Cyprian had shot at earlier drifted low over their heads and plowed into the dirt behind them, spraying the lines with dirt and debris. The rifles and machine guns did little to dissuade the remaining choppers to back away, but when two more of them came crashing down to the rubble and flames from well-placed RPGs, the pilots began to see that the Republic troops had more armaments than they had anticipated. Another gunship went down, and the air was thick with smoke and thrown up dirt, to the point that the pilots had split seconds to react as more and more rockets came rushing at them. Within 30 minutes of the first wildcast destruction, the rest began to withdraw. We drove them back, came a voice from down the line. Cyprian looked out, keeping steady hands on his AK, but as the smoke cleared, he saw that the call was correct. The remaining gunships were retreating over the harbor. Cheers began to ripple down the line as his men, exhausted and filthy, caught their first glimpse of victory. Captain Cyprian would have cheered too, but as he scanned the remainder of his forces, his heart sank. At least a third of his men were gone, and a dozen or so more injured. That left him with under 200 soldiers to make a stand against the ground. Hold your horses, boys, came a shrill voice from the front line, which had taken the brunt of the gunship's attack and was now all but decimated. 
A soldier with a blood-soaked cloth around his left forearm was peering out over the debris to the south through a pair of binoculars. The lines went instantly quiet. At first, only the light, cool wind was audible as it swept away the last clouds of smoke. But only at first. Low rumbling noises began to reach their ears, followed by the pitter-patter of distant feet clambering in their direction. Soon enough, voices could be heard. But whether they were shouting to each other or just shouting was impossible to tell. Hold on to your butts, men! Cyprian yelled. Get ready, because all hell's about to break loose! Colonel Ruckinson looked at his watch. Five o'clock. Sitting atop his Challenger 3 main battle tank, he had been able to hear the guns of the support fleet even from his position of a mile and a half south of the city, and the ships were eight miles out at sea. Just moments ago, he'd received word that recon aircraft had spotted a small resistance force, and now a squad of wildcat gunships were strafing the ruins to root them out. He leaned against the side of the turret and yawned. At this rate, there'll be no defense left for us to fight, he thought ruefully. The menace drifted by slowly. He could hear the soldiers around him begin to grumble and mutter, having to sit in hiding while the helicopters got all the action. Why the hell are we even here if we don't get to fight? A voice distantly said. Ruckinson couldn't help but agree. He was getting bored. Perhaps I should ring up the Admiral, he mused, and ask him to call back the Wildcats so that we... His radio burst with static, interrupting his thoughts and nearly making him jump out of his commander's cupola. He had to reach across the gun mantlet to get the mouthpiece from where he had slid before he could respond. What in the blazes was that for? He barked angrily. What's going on over there? Colonel, came the voice, which, judging by the repetitive beating of air in the background, must have been one of the pilots. The resistance here is stronger than we had anticipated, and they possess much heavier weaponry as well. Ruckinson was standing on the edge of the tank's turret now, peering over in the direction of the city. All right, men. I'll bring my troops in immediately. Just, just hang in there a little longer, and we'll sweep them away for you. Negative, sir. We've already lost four gunships, with three others damaged. We've been ordered to withdraw at once. You'll have to go in and finish them off without our support. We can't risk losing any more choppers. Ruckinson wasn't sure whether or not he was dis disappointed or delighted. It was finally time for him to get into the action, but he wouldn't have any air support. The defenders had shot down four wildcats. Four of them. That meant they were tough. That meant there would be a good fight. Ruckinson smiled. Very well, soldier. You and your buddies get yourselves to safety. We can take it from here. Roger that, Colonel. Wildcat 3 out. He put down the radio and raised a hand in the air, all five fingers outstretched, catching the attention of everyone around him. The commanders of the other tanks and armored vehicles raised their hands as well, sending the signal down the line that they were about to mobilize. The colonel looked around at his men. They were on their toes, guns in hand, ready to spring into action. A lot of them were even smiling. Ruggenson turned to face the city, a broad grin breaking over his countenance as well. The sounds of helicopter blades thundered across the landscape as the remaining wildcats could be seen returning to the carrier from which they had deployed in the support fleet. That was it. Ruckinson joined his fingers together and waved his arm forward. The tank's engines roared to life, jerking into motion. Soldiers all around broke into a run. Armored vehicles and APCs rolled past their slower, heavier counterparts. It was like a race. A race to see who could get to the action first. A race to see who would go down in history as the first man to set foot in the conquered city of Kulasuk. A race to see who would die first from this blind rush at the prepared enemy. A concussive bang resounded from the southern ruins. Captain Cyprian didn't need to look to know the source. Having tended to their wounded as best they could and redug in themselves after the gunships had retreated, Cyprian's defense team was now entrenched behind the fallen wall of a building that somehow still stood atop a hill of rubble. Not only did they have a new place of cover, but they also had high ground, forcing the British troops to climb up the slope of debris to reach them. Another explosion was set off in the distance, as the enemy forces drew nearer. Only this time they caught the last screams of the unfortunate soldier who had stepped on the mine. Finally looking over the wall behind which they had set up, 
the Republic defenders could see several armored vehicles plowing through the wreckage, while columns of infantry lined up behind them to avoid being shot at from directly ahead. Demo charges, barked Cyprian. A soldier not far down the line nodded and opened up a small case that contained a complex-looking mechanism riddled with switches. The captain returned his gaze to the approaching enemy, allowing them a little more time to advance. He nodded to the soldier at the device. One of the armored vehicles went up in a pillar of fire and smoke as the first charge was detonated. The shouts of orders being given soon filled the air as the British forces began taking positions and scanning the terrain for whatever caused the blast. Another charge went off, this one blowing out the last support beams of a ruined office building, causing it to collapse onto 30 soldiers who had been unfortunate enough to be hiding in its shadow. Every 10 seconds, Cyprian would have his men set off another charge, until, three minutes after the first was detonated, they had all been used. It took some time before the enemy regrouped, but even while the infantry were forming themselves up for the charge up the hill, the Challenger 3s caught wind of where the defenders were hiding and opened fire, showering the blockade with their high explosive shells. Brace for impact! Cyprian shouted, his voice being trumped by the ear-rending blast that tore the ruined walls to pieces. Rubble obscured his vision, though he could see that at least a dozen more of his men had already been blown away by the by the assault. Prepare grenades! RPG launchers ready! As the smoke and ashes died down, he was relieved to find that his men were still at their positions, priming their grenades and loading rocket tubes. However, his heart sank at their number. At most, eight dozen left, if that many. The pieces of the rest were strewn hither and thither, and he could feel his stomach churning at the sight of seeing human entrails firsthand. Sir! The enemy are approaching! The boy snapped him out of it, turning his disgust at the gruesome spectacle to wrath and desire for vengeance. He looked out over the wall and saw that the infantry were scrambling up the hill of rubble en masse, supported by the APCs and tanks, though the ascent made the vehicle slower on the approach than those on foot. Throw grenades! he shouted. Instantaneously, a barrage of handheld explosives came showering down on the front line of British infantry. Several of them stumbled. Others looked up to see what was going on, while still others got one last look of what had just bounced off their helmets before being ripped to shreds by shrapnel and having their remains blown meters into the air by the blasts. Within seconds, the entire first wave of troops was reduced to bleeding corpses and chunks of dismembered meat. Open fire! The captain bellowed at the top of his lungs. Rockets! Rifles! Machine guns! All of it! Give them hell! Gunfire temporarily deafened him as he was instantly obeyed, nearly a hundred weapons unleashing their fury upon the invaders. Captain, said one of the soldiers as he fitted a new magazine into his AK-47, we're low on ammo, we can't keep this up much longer. Then give them all we have, he replied. Shoot them down to your last bullet and then pull back to the tunnels. Our work here is almost done. Ruckinson roared in anger as he beheld his men being cut to pieces by the hailstorm of bullets that had suddenly burst from the rebels' line. The others were continuing the advance, but the cost of lives was much higher than he had anticipated. For a ragtag group of freedom fighters from a fledgling, primitive island nation, these terrorist gunmen were pretty darn well-armed and had pretty darn good aim. A rocket-propelled grenade zipped by him and hit another challenger dead-on in center of this lower glatches plate easily piercing the lighter armor and detonating within the hull. The colonel winced as he could hear the crew being roasted alive by the heat of the blast force before it completely exploded from an ignited ammunition rack. That was it. Enough was enough. This is Colonel Ruckins into Meteor 1. We need an airstrike and we need it now! Static and, were those explosions? Were all I could hear in response. Meteor 1! This is Colonel Ruckinson of the Royal Expeditionary Forces Ground Assault Division. We are taking heavy casualties and request an airstrike. Do you copy? A stream of bullets washed over his tank's turret, forcing him to duck back into the machine's interior to avoid becoming a humanoid pincushion. When the ricocheting of projectiles ceased, he climbed back up to the cupola and grabbed his microphone. Curses, he muttered, seeing that it had been blasted to pieces by the volley. Stupid thing was probably broken anyway. He poked his head out of the turret once more 
and found that his men had reached the mountain summit and were already within the defenders' fortifications. However, he didn't hear the sound of gunfire or explosions or the screams of dying men. He stood atop the tank and took out his binoculars, scanning the surrounding area for signs of the enemy. Nothing. Colonel, came a voice. Ruggenson turned to see a group of soldiers walking over to him, their leader holding a scrap of paper in his hand. Speak up, lads, he replied. Any sign of the rebels? They shook their heads. No, sir. We've searched the entrenchment and came across quite a few corpses, but no survivors. Good job, then, boys. Looks like we won, then. The lead soldier nodded slowly, lowering his gaze. It looks like it, sir, but I'm not quite sure. He held out his hand with the piece of paper in it. Ruggenson took it awkwardly, giving the young man and the other soldiers with him a skeptical look. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, son, but I... The words caught in his throat as he saw what the paper had written on it. This ain't the last you've seen of us. Be happy with your victory, because it's the last one you'll get on Republic soil. He looked at the soldiers who had given him the message. Now he knew why they were doubting the day was a real victory. He stepped down from the tank and took, stood in front of the closest soldier in the group. Get to the first communication specialist you can find and have him contact the support fleet. Tell Admiral Rolf that these bloody reinforcements had better get here soon. I fear that we're going to need all the help we can get.